Sexy's Lady Sussex here. Uh, what an amazing day. What an amazing day. Uh, well, before we get started, I would like to say to you guys, to all of you who had tuned in, that you had download um, the podcast and watch what listen on YouTube, um, wherever you're listening, um, thank you so much. I mean, it's been a long time. I mean, life happened, as you know. Um, but I've been in the game, I've been in the fight, you know, all along, you know, behind the scenes, supporting all the squaddies and um, the new shows, the new kids on the block. And I mean, the army is getting big and bigger every day and I love it and I'm here for it. And so I wanted it to come back and because I still have a lot to say. And, and again, the fight doesn't stop hear from me whether you know you hear me or um you don't hear me i am we are fighting the fight because it's a fight that's worth fighting so um welcome and let's get the show started Happy day when Jesus was when Jesus was when Jesus was What's up with you Charles when come Jesus on was, when oh, Jesus I'm, I'm, was I'm a loving out a singer was, wash my sins away oh, oh happy day Oh my happy day Well guys there is day. one singer here and it's not me <laughs> So guys my goodness how are you guys doing uh, really hot because it's the summer, but other than that, wonderful and excited to be back. It's been a while. It has been a very long time. No, it's been great. It's been great. It's definitely been a long time. Looking forward to getting back. And uh, you know, as Georgia said, it's it, it is hot. <laughs> it is it is sticky as all get out in this box. And of course, guys, it just to I mean, wow. To um, I guess what would what would you say that to represent ourselves again or to Reintroduce um, ourselves. To reintroduce yes. ourselves again. Well, I am. It has Lady been long enough. Everyone forgot us. Lady Sussex, and I choose that name because I am all things Sussex, and I think it was an appropriate name. Um, and we have Charles, who pretty much helped with all the technology stuff in the smarts here, and then we have, of course, George with this brilliant mind, and um, the one that I go to. So. Um, yeah, and so it's good to have them back, and let's go back into it. So great to be back. Sounds good. Archetype is out. Harry is doing big thing. He's playing polo. He's raining a lot, doing great job out there. And our girls find her voice. And we've been waiting for the show we know it was coming so what did you guys think well the first thing i want to know is how much caffeine do the two of them use on a daily basis to do all of the things that they're doing it's crazy i feel like every other week there's a new headline about some amazing thing that that they've done i'm just like wow oh my god <laughs> how do you keep up I mean, with these I two think i don't know for all of us the squad that it has been supported, who has been coming in the front line. We are the soldier, and we've been holding them, and then we've been hoping for today to come. And it was like one after another, one after another, she dropped it like it's hot, like it was Beyonce thing and, and, and doing her thing. And today we have Uncut, the New York mag magazine, just come out with, uh, oh, my God, I, I just like, I'm so overwhelmed and so happy and so excited because um, we're going to get into it. We're going to get deep into everything that was saying, the conversation that she had with um, Serena Williams. And I, I don't think we fully grasp how deep, how personal, and how heartfelt, and how worried that we all are. And we know what she was going through. 
because we was in the front line with her, fighting with her, especially when she lost her voice. And so to go in full circle now and see her gaining back her voice, the one that she finds since she was 11 years old, it's a great thing. It's, it's, it's a day of celebration. And we need to give ourselves, the squad, a round of applause. Come on, what, what, what's going on with the clapping? Really? Wow, are, are we very... Wow. I have to... We are rusty. It's been a, it's been a year and a half. I have to figure out how to work the tools again. Come on. It's been a long time. I'm telling you. <laughs> it happens. Uh-huh. See, see, it happens. It happens. Round of applause. Continue failing. So, guys, George... So talk to me. What did you make of archetype between the two, the conversation? What did you take from it? How did you find yourself relate or not relate? Because I do think archetype can be men, women, white, black. You know, there is that stereotype that society put on every single one of us. I mean, of course, you know, for us that, you know, are... Um, you know, I guess um, black or, um, you know, I guess, what would you call it? Um, mixed race. Mixed race, biracial, and Asian, or anybody, there's always this type. And then so you don't know where it comes from, but somehow, true or false, it sticks with you, and it becomes a thing. So what did you guys I think for me, I um, actually thought that the approach of how they talked about it, uh, her and Serena, was just a refreshing one because it was um, just, it seemed very authentic, you know? It seemed like them sharing their actual experiences in the, and and how, the, I think, and, and Megan talked about it a lot in the show itself, is like, what is the human side? And so to talk about issues that matter outside of an academic context, outside of a political context, outside of all of the different constructs that we usually use to talk about those sort of issues, but just more from the human lens. Uh, I thought it was, it was refreshing. It also just Very made nice. it much easier to future? listen to and to relate to. Uh, I think it humanized them. Um, I mean, you see and listen and, and watch these personalities on the television and everywhere else. And uh, you can certainly get the idea that they're they're not really people, you know, they're just these icons, right? But uh, you know, but to hear them speak, as George had mentioned, I mean, I think it really just kind of humanized them and personalized them in a way that really I had not uh, I had not witnessed before. And then uh, I think Megan actually did a good job hosting the show. Really, I think she asked some very interesting questions. Um, I think that going through. Uh, Serena's experiences, uh, while certainly she's a woman of ambition, has done amazing things. Uh, while they were talking about kind of the challenges that she's had on the court, specifically, uh, I could not get past the racial overtones behind all of it. Just because, you know, I don't know if it was the fact that she was a woman of ambition that they started to call all of her balls out. Versus the fact that, you know, perhaps it was more of a, a racial component behind why they were making the wrong calls. So it was an interesting kind of dichotomy in terms of, okay, well, how they actually, tr how they believe or how they were looking at it in terms of trying to deny her that ambition or deny her kind of that success versus some of the factors that actually may be contributing to that as well. So also just kind of trying to compare and understand, you know, really the, the levels in terms of what society brings on us so you know you have women and then you have black women and within those even just those two groups you know the Very the differences nice. i think well, say, were pretty I, clear I, I, you know it's it's um interesting that you know you say the racial tone um and i kept thinking a part of me listening um before i had a chance to actually hear um listen to the podcast 
um, as you see, you know, I'm on social media and sort of watching what everybody say and, you know, sort of I was getting like the second hand what's going on, what's happening and, you know, how everybody think about it and all that. And and of course, you know, in the media, they, they keep playing these clips. One of the things that, you know what, um, I did not hear from Serena and I was hoping that I would hear it. And it was... Um, how they degrade her as a black woman, how they talk about her structure, her body, um, why she looked the way she does, you know, her masculinity body that she had. And so they pretty much really went after her, degrade her and also that. But she chose not to talk about it and Megan chose not to bring it in. And I was a little bit bummed out because I thought it would have been a moment for a lot of people black women in general and other um, sort of um, athletes that all have the same issues. Um, spatially right now, there is a racial undertone where that, you know, people feel like to call every black woman, especially dark skin women, a man. And so that really sort of, I was a little bit disappointed. Then I started thinking it was genius on their part, not to bring it. And I tell you why, because I think, because they didn't make it so much about race, they can say what they say and you can hear it the way you yourself hear it, but yet being able to open a dialogue where whether you were Asian, whether you were, you know, sort of white or black or whatever part, you see yourself, you see yourself a part of that conversation. You, it happened to you, you know, as a woman and even men, you know, whether you're black men, I don't have to actually specifically talk about the um, racial component of it as important as it is. But we all know this serial type. We all know. Do you understand what I mean? Because I think sometimes one of the things that happened in, in our society is that the moment that, you know, we start talking about race, it seems for certain people, they just shut down and they don't want to hear. They don't want, they just, and to, for them to be able to say what they wanted to say, make it as much as you want, whether it's the memories that for me, that comes out of this, seeing how she was um, being, I mean, <laughs> I don't even want to say those words because it was just so painful, so hurtful that she could not be celebrated for her great for her great um, ness on the court. But yet they will sit down and talk about her body. They talk about everything else but what she was doing on the court and how she was changing the game for the better. And you know it was sad, and so. I think in so many ways, as you yourself pick it up, the undertone, she did talk about it. And so I think it was genius. And that's the reason why the show is number one everywhere. Yeah, I think that, I mean, I, I, I agree with you. I think the reason why they probably didn't bring up the idea of, you know, the racial component behind everything Correct. was probably to make it more appealing just to a wider audience. And because, again, what they're talking about, they weren't really talking. It wasn't a racial discussion. It was a discussion about women generally and then basically the, the archetypes that are put onto women mm -hmm. that they have to dispel or otherwise understand mm -hmm. to improve upon. So, And that's something, you know, race is a very big topic and it's a pretty um, sensitive topic. So they could have very easily spun off right. on a tangent. So it was probably wise not to bring it up right. because it would but have just led to a very different time, conversation. which could not pass everything that happened to the both of them because of their race and it's interesting because of the kind of putting in the context of the two of them and their shared lives that they were able to be there to support each other but that what they were going through it uh, going through it at the same time and kind of the the for someone who's not in the spotlight for someone who's not in the in that world and be able to say wow it's not i, I think the way charles you said at the beginning that it's not just these icons or names that are just floating out there in the ether but these are real people you know right. 
and and what does it take to actually deal with that and to and to see again when when you can see the empathy actually happening as opposed to it just being described you see it from the the nature of the relationship between the two of them that also makes it a little bit more real and just easier to understand for someone who's on the outside i have a question for each of you guys how have you been specifically yourself in terms of like akata anything that you know what that people sort of put on you guys or you know that just not really fair or somehow that you know make you feel some kind of way or make you feel timid is there anything you know you guys could speak on that maybe in some way affect you guys specifically oh sure i mean just growing up as a biracial man i mean there's all kinds of ways that people have addressed me and as you grow up especially i grew up in the south as well so and in the you know in the 70s and 8 and early 80s uh, you know, having biracial parents was not a normal thing. So people would always, you know, call you very, you know, disgusting things. So certainly I think that's just been, um, you know, those are labels that you have to learn to live with. And, you know, how do you and try and ingest them in a way that's not damaging to yourself? Uh, but just realize that, okay, well, that's a perception that basically exists about you. And then... You either have to like grovel on the ground and, and wrestle with it and let it defeat you or you have to rise above it. And so I think that's that's a lot of what I think being a black man just generally is about, is about how to kind of get past um, kind of common perception of who you happen to be. I mean, if you think about it, I mean, one in three black men above the age of 25 is in jail. So, I mean, that's just, that's just what it is. So the fact that I'm not, and I'm nearing 45 is an accomplishment in and of itself. But the, the picture that society frames someone such as myself and just black people generally is, is something that you have to struggle with, you know, your whole life. And it's also something that, um, is at the same time also uniquely personal because the experiences that you have are unique to you, even though they may be shared and similar, but it's you yourself have to digest them. You yourself have to live with them. And so, and you, and you yourself have to understand them. So uh, it's, it's a, it's an interesting thing. You know, labels are uh, something that can be used for great benefit. And at the same time, uh, just completely devastating as well. Interestingly, there is one of the reporters that wrote something that was quite insulting to me, I think, the, the kind of dog whistle um, language where she's stating that, you know, regarding the dog that, you know, what, um, Harry and Megan just had that, which is such a beautiful story, and we'll talk about it a little bit later in the show. Um, she called it the dumb mutt, and we know what that means. First of all, even calling any dog dumb, I mean, really, seriously? I mean, do you need to go there? Do you know the dog? What makes the dog dumb? And mutt, we know what that means. You know, the two mutt, which, who are the two mutt she was talking about? It's like, for me, it's what I grew up hearing any biracial person, they always try to address them mutt. And I'm like, how did you feel reading that? Well, I mean, certainly, like I said, I mean, it's one of those things you just kind of get desensitized to, <laughs> you know, I've been called that my entire life. It's not, it's, it's something that really almost has no meaning for me anymore because it's just something that just goes in one ear and out the other because I can't let it, I can't let it impact me. Mm. Um, but I mean, mud mud is kind <laughs> um in terms of some of the things that's been said so the one i probably remember the most um it was actually from a black guy too which was something that i just didn't expect was being called a zebra hmm. so and that was like kind of a word and kind of a name that kind of got stuck associated with me back then 
Um, and it made me think about it a lot because I mean, you as a person don't necessarily reflect on your color that much, right? You're an individual. You think about things individually about, okay, well, I'm doing X, Y, and Z. You don't think about, okay, well, I, as a black man are doing X, Y, and Z, at least not as a kid. I think I do that much more as an adult because there's, there's implications and, and certainly circumstances that I have to, um, if I'm pulled over by a cop, I have to think that, oh, I am a black man. So how am I going to get out of this? As a black man, how, how do I need to behave in order to make sure that I'm not going to end up in jail at the back of a police car or shot upside, you know, and dug in a small grave on the side of a hill somewhere? So I think as, you know, as you learn, uh, and I think my parents actually had a lot to do with that as well, just because they tried, they tried their best not to get into those conversations, I think just kind of insulate us from it and kind of try and protect us from that kind of, you know, uh, discrimination around it. Um, you know, for good or ill, but I think that's what their intent was, was to kind of help provide this kind of shielding for us so we don't necessarily think of our way, uh, think of ourselves in any other way outside of ourselves uh, in terms of who we are. So uh, when you're confronted with it directly, it's certainly something that impacts you. And I think it's certainly something that sticks with you. I mean, here I am talking about this guy who I haven't thought about of in 40 years, but um, I mean, clearly it's still stuck. That's interesting because you say that, and I, it is just what I was thinking about when you said that you're desensitized to the term. It's one of those things like uh, this is something that I don't relate to in the same way at all, being a white man. But I can't imagine how there's not also the subconscious material impact that's happening. Even though you've kind of seemed like you've trained yourself to let it go in one year and out the other year, it's it's hard to imagine that it doesn't. That in and of itself, that process of doing that doesn't have its own kind of implications and consequences. I'm sure it does because obviously it stick with you and of that whatever how many years you could just like that bring it up do you understand what i mean yes you do because that's what we all have to do we kind of suppress this feeling we suppress because that's how we're able to do the things that we do wake up every day and just said okay but it's still there it's still there it still manifests itself in some other ways and but i don't think it just black of course we get affected a lot by it but is the asian and i'll dare say as privileged i think all white people are they too i'm sure i don't know you tell me is there anything or how you feel like people pursued you or white person that put you in a category that you feel like was unfair or that's not you but you have to deal with because you're white no. <laughs> no, 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 and I really? think I think that's the thing that's also sh it's it, it's uh, maybe it's not not the right idea to laugh at it, but it's it's one of those things where it's it's so uh, not a thing growing up. It's part of privilege. It's the it's the privilege that you're born into that you don't even think about it, you know. And, and I will just want to shout out, just not to interrupt you at all, um, George, but you know we we must say, uh, include our Latino friends. In, in those as well. So Absolutely. I think any, any, any minority, uh, at least from within the U.S., I think is subject to, to those kinds of feelings and situations. Absolutely. Yeah, because I've been thinking about your question, which is what, what kind of archetype or, or stereotype or whatever it is have you been, has been put on you that's impacted your life or that unfairly boxed you and made you feel away. And it's like the only, the only thing that I've been called uh, or described as is arrogant. And I don't think that's, I, don't, I mean, I've, uh, <laughs> when I, when I've gotten that, it's oftentimes like taking it as a, um, taking it in a, tr flipping it on its head in a positive way. Like, yes, I do believe in myself kind of thing and, and trying to not see the negative in it, but it has never been anything that, um, that I feel like has, has come at me in a way that's put me in that box. And I think that's evident, uh, and, and example enough and, representative of what it is to be a white man in, in the United States and to have that privilege. Wow. One of the things that Megan talk about, it's how that, you know, as a you know, little girl, that, you know, most little girl, I suppose even boys, you are very fearless and you want to do everything. You think you can do everything. And, um, and as you start going older, and you feel like all these things are chipping, that kind of confidence is chipping away. And a lot of it has to do with what society put on you. And for me, I feel like 
I relate to it, but I'm so happy that I had an, am I had an amazing uh, mom and dad, really, that believe in me and believe that I can do anything and push me in spite of everything. And God knows I've been through a lot in my life. Yeah, it's what uh, also struck me listening to the show is, for me, I've never there's never really been a, a negative connotation with ambition or with competitiveness. And I think certainly certainly not when it comes to men, but also in my mind, I'm trying to think back for for women as well. And I'm and I I, I struggle to think of it in in from personal examples for myself. I, I'm sure that it's just because I also don't I'm not was not thinking about it explicitly to kind of be able to see it it just kind of went unnoticed but i'm also curious if we think that there for this particular archetype um if it is something that there's just progress being made in the country in terms of it not having that negative stigma for for women or if it's still something that there's a lot of r room to grow i'm actually not sure i think what is happening is we are in a verge of a huge revolution when it comes to women how we see ourselves, we we get into a point where we're not letting anybody define us, and that we are going to define ourselves. And we looked at these words, and they are white. No, it does not mean it doesn't impact us. It doesn't affect us. There's many people that will sort of, you know, will pay a huge price and sacrifice, you know, because of this word, because of the stereotype. But you also have a lot of women out there. That is finding their voice that was pushing the envelope the fact that you know um megan um our duchess or princess decided to say you know no you're not gonna shut me out i think it's so important to have people like her like serena anybody that has a platform who had much more up you know it makes you feel like well okay if it happened to them then you know and then they push to it and they do what they do then I need to do the same and you block it. You don't let it affect you because at the end of the day, you know, the haters, the people going to do what they do. They're going to say whatever they want to say. It's how do you not let that impact you from what you have to do? And so, so for me, I think this is the lesson. This is what I get from this because it's them, you know, showing us and telling us, no, you know, I'm like you. I've been through the same thing too. But somehow that they make a decision because that is, it, it is a decision to say enough is enough. Yeah, it's one of those things, though, I think we need to be careful that the exception could prove the rule. And I think that both of those women are very exceptional. I think Beyonce is exceptional. <laughs> uh, but at the, end, at the end of the day, I mean, you know, we're also still live in the world of Harvey Weinstein. Mm -hmm. You know, the Me Too movement was a thing. Mm -hmm. um, and... I think that it does speak to progress, the fact that a Me Too movement was actually a thing because obviously right. it was resolved and he's in jail or right. whatever he's doing, but it didn't stop it from happening, you know? And I think that the glass ceiling is definitely a thing. Yeah, I think well, there's a certain point to where, you know, the there's a boardroom full of, you know, dudes yeah, and they're like, it's not. oh yeah, yeah, I, I just know. think that, you know what, we women in now for whatever the reason, we go in some and want to fight back. It doesn't mean that it's not going to happen because again, you know, you're looking at the progress for every progress we hear and the Western world is making. There's still women that, you know what, are still like unable to even just go to school or even do anything. So, I mean, it, it is a thing. I but think it would be safe to say that it's, that it's beginning. It I think a there's beginning. a social beginning. There's a social beginning, an awakening too. But for me, is is that you know, this is where I want to move, move the conversation because obviously it's society. Society, it's us, it's you, it's I, it's everybody that's included. And so, for me, how do we, especially you guys that are men, who now coming to term and understanding how that infect women. What is it that you want to do in your own life to make sure that you could be an example, whether it's you, your kids one day or, you know, your wife or your, your sister or cousin? How do you yourself begin to change things? Because it has the man has to be a part of it. The man has to be able to sort of if you now know and you understand, you agree 
that what is it that you know you think you yourself can do i think the the step one anyway for me is to say to myself that there's a need to to have almost a, a deliberate consciousness to to have it in mind so that it's not just living in this sort of uh um privileged state that i was lucky enough to be born into where i don't actually have to pay attention to any of those things but to actually pause and think and and try to be cognizant of those things that are happening even if they aren't necessarily happening to me to notice it in the first place to then be able to do something about it it, it, it that's that first step is to, to have it in mind and to be aware of it and to be cognizant and then i think when when that is successfully done and and kind of employed throughout our daily lives then that is what will allow us to say, to to take those instances uh, here and and there throughout our just general days and say no that's not okay no that shouldn't be used as a negative connotation no that's actually a positive thing that this woman is ambitious that's a positive thing that she's competitive um and don't use that as a as a negative like, to hold against her um but to applaud it and i think that it's, that's what needs to happen but to, to get to that point again it's it's actually just being cognizant in the first place that's right whatever about you well, I think the big thing, I mean, I agree with um, what George mentioned is just simply the fact that, okay, well, you need to be self-aware of what's going on, you know, and, and you yourself in terms of um, how you may be perpetuating these kinds of archetypes. Right. Actually, what I was going to say, because the way I wanted to phrase that question, because I think very often that black men doesn't stand out for their own women. And, and the fear is, is that, you know, they're going to be attacked. And so they allowed that to happen, or they're afraid. And so sometimes they themselves end up carry that serial type, you know, because they pick it up from wherever. So how do you yourself understand that? That's, you don't bring that home. You don't continue that pat pattern. Um, well, I mean, as again, I think it's just recognizing what it is. Um, you know, and under and, and learning what those what those patterns are, so you can identify them and, and try and rectify it. I think uh, black men are um, in a bit of a different situation because I think there's a lot of um, there there just are there's very there's strong black women, right? I mean, they say thing, and you know, and black women in this country, um, you know, are. You know, they're the breadwinners. There's usually the, you know, they're, they're like the sole parents. Like, I mean, there's so much that's, that goes on behind black women that basically they're the pillar of the community, like by far. So I think there's just a lot of love um, in the community for them. So I think it, it impacts black people, black men a little bit differently just because, you know, the nurturing aspect and they've seen, they've seen the struggles. And so I think there's a lot of respect there. Um, not to say that they don't have their own problems because... They absolutely do. I think I myself, um, one of the big things that kind of struck me in, um, in the conversation that Megan and Serena had were when they pointed out the differences between, because Megan played a little bit of a clip in terms of, you know, men shouting at refs and Serena couldn't obviously do the same thing. So I think when you start to look at that deliberate unfairness and you notice it, that, um, that you need to speak up about it or at least acknowledge that okay well if you know this guy basically is speaking to you in such a manner and you know and you feel that this respectful and then for a woman to speak to you in the same way should also be respectful and you should also take it in the same way it doesn't mean just because she's a woman that you need to take it somewhere else that it doesn't necessarily need to go so and i think i think that's something to to kind of just think about is realizing is realizing in the moment of when it happens and then try and keep it in perspective to see, you know, if there's innate fairness or if there's actually some sort of, you know, deliberate maliciousness behind what people are trying to do. Okay. Just to get back to um, what you just saying when you're competing between men and women, you are not saying, and I hope this is, is, you know, people don't think you're coming across that. And if that's what you meant, maybe we need to correct that. You're not saying that you think, black women are treated in a much more favorable than black men does no 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 that's no the opposite of anything no what i'm what i'm saying at 
when mentioning the examples that they had is that men were basically, if men went to the ref and were obnoxious about it or shouted curse words and these kinds of things. talking about black men, sort of, you know, how you were talking even talk about, um, you know, strong black women, which, you know, um, I used to be okay with it until I'm not okay with it. Obviously, we're all strong. Every woman in general, whether you're black, white, you know, if you can carry a baby for nine months and you push it and you raise it and you do all that, being a single, you, you, you're strong. But I think the way they attach strong to black women, that has a very different meaning. You know, it's like, you know, sort of, you know, you're strong. Somehow you can deal with everything. And a white woman, it's it's princess like, you know, she she's very fragile and she's very soft. And so, you know, for an example, if a cop, you know, will dare pick up a, a black woman and shove it, you know, on the floor and stomp on her as if like it's nothing. But, you know, sort of, you know, white woman is a very different. She's so fragile. We must protect her. We must this, we must that. And so to me, when I hear anybody, whether he's a black person or thing in and talk in a manner of say, well, you're strong. Yes, we are all strong because we have to be strong to deal with so many things that throw at us. But at the same token, we are vulnerable. We are soft. We are feminine. We are um, everything. Like any woman, we feel pain. We feel so. To me, I know you don't mean it in any kind of way, but it's for whatever. Reason. No, I can, yeah, I can, I can clarify. Yeah, no, I can, I can, clarify. Kind of I can clarify. I can clarify what that is. Don't settle well. With me. Yeah, no, I can clarify what that is. I think, and it actually goes back to what I was mentioning before. I think what you're, what you're associating it with is basically the racial component behind right. what's going on, which is not what we're talking about. We're talking about basically just, you know, the, 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 the gender differences, right? So, and my comment regarding the strong black women is basically within the black community, because again, they are the pillar of the community. Well, and, well, and, and, true, and true. that, and that, and, and, and it was, it was how, at least for me, anyway, my perception and, and I could be, I could have the wrong perception about how black men view their women is, I believe that they're, they view their women as being, you know, as being the breadwinners, as being basically the, the, again, the pillar of the community because they are, they are the support. They literally are the support and the foundation for the entire community. So I think their view of their view of women or of their, at least their own women, I think may be different. And again, I don't know. I'm just, again, putting my own kind of thing on it. Maybe different from how white men may view women of their particular gender. But that's the problem though, because it's that expectation that somehow that you know what and for some black men there's 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 black men that just worship the ground of the black woman and sort of you know being there so that is not you know you know one size fit all but unfortunately it's the bad that always stands out the most and so when you looked at you know a lot of black men and there is that expectation somehow that you know we can do it all, we can have it all, we can, you know, and not understanding that, you know what, the reason why, you, you know, we had to do it all, the reason why we had to fight so hard, because may, very often they're not home, very often that they're in jail, very often that, you know, at society don't afford them the stuff they need to be home, to taking care of a kid, or when they are home, they don't stay home. Or they're out there, they're doing their thing, they're hustling. Whatever it is that they're doing, they leave us to deal with everything else on top of all the trauma. So you have, I guess in so many ways, we had to be, you know, um, strong in the middle of a suffering or in the middle of anything that may be going through. And so I think there's a sense of abuse that comes with it. It's like, okay, you know, I don't have to worry about it because you get it, but you never ask if I'm okay. You never ask, you know, how I feel about it. And I think that is the misconception for many men, especially men of color, black men in particularly, it's for many of them that doesn't really sort of sit down and ask, is it okay? 
is it okay that, you know, assuming that, you know, that's what we're supposed to be doing, that, you know, we get it, we're going to support them, we're going to support them in jail, we're going to support them to no matter what it is that they do. I feel like we are really getting deep, but that's what I like about that type of conversation because it's one that we need to have. And I'm sure for many people at home, um, the fact this archetype show is number one everywhere, I'm sure everybody is having some type of form of that conversation. For me, it's a positive thing. It's interesting, the this conversation in the context of archetypes, because I think that's basically what Megan seems to be trying to focus on throughout the for as the entirety of the show, which is that words have significant implications and they have they can have a boxing effect boxing in effect on the people who they are applied to and so <clears throat> the term strong black woman is it's interesting because to your point it it has a lot of uh implications and and weight and significance behind it that is not always positive uh and i think part of what it seems like megan is trying to do is to to have a better understanding of those terms and what they can and can mean um and also to empower people and women specifically to be able to rather use their own terms to define themselves and say this is this is who i am this is actually who i am that's how she ended the the segment with um serena and say and and you know in fairness maybe some black women say yes i am a strong black woman and that's that's how they want to identify themselves that's how they that's their choice of, of who they are and how they feel but I, there's a difference between it being an individual's choice of how they want to represent themselves and who they are to themselves versus what is it when it comes from society and has this sort of effect of boxing in someone to to, to act or behave or have to live in a certain uh in certain circumstances wow. well guys i told you guys that we are going to get deep and I hope the show is not too long for you guys, but we're going to move very quickly on something that was very important, very, oh my God, it was like, we know it, we know it was happening, and we can tell there's so much thing that was in it to actually hear her, her saying that, you know what, what happened, what could have happened to Archie, it was like, like, I feel, I find myself start sweating, I, it, it just... And it's because that, you know what, if you follow them and you see them on that tour, prior to everything that they were going through, the fact that this woman, if you listen to um, her sh the show Oprah and saying that, you know, how she was feeling suicidal and everything that she was going to, I mean, obviously a lot of the stuff is allegedly, we wasn't there. We could only go by what we see, what we hear, and try to put two and two together and listen to. But obviously, we wasn't there, so we have to say allegedly. But to see when she was being interviewed, and that too, and to see her face, to see Harry, and you could see obviously there's something wrong. There's something that was just too much, when we didn't know what it was. Well, maybe most people didn't know what it was, but the squad know something was wrong. It was very obvious something is wrong. Something is not right. And to now hear that, you know what, what could have happened? And it, it just like, I was froze. I must say it was just like, and what is even more insulting and then for us to like, well, wait a minute, is that all you guys have out there? You guys are really weak, wicked media. Yes, you're a tabloid, but you have, I mean, the best you got is to say that, you know, well, you know, she's exaggerated. It was just smoke. It's not like everyone is recall. What do you mean it was, it was just smoke? <laughs> Where there's fire, there's smoke, right? And obviously... That kid will have a four-year long. It could be really, really bad. Four months. Four months old. Mm -hmm. And so to me, when you started looking at the media, and as I said again, it's not all journalists, it's not all papers, it's not all sort of, um, uh, um, there is still very good journalists. There's still people that you know what, or like 
that will bring us the information which we depend on, which we sort of value and, you know, but unfortunately, those who have the mic or the pen or the paper to print out this kind of garbage, it's the one that was loudest that, that stands out and it's affecting. And when to get into a place where you really do, I mean, who are you? What kind of months do you have kids? Do you have, I mean, really seriously? Is that how you would have felt if it was any member of your family? I mean, make it make sense for me because I don't really, I don't get how a human being sitting down with pen and paper who have mom, who have dad, who have sister, who have brother, even kids and husband and say, you know what? I'm choosing that I'm going to hit on someone that was done absolutely nothing to me. Someone that I don't know. Someone that, you know, I pretty much really know nothing about. But I'm going to create things. Even though this woman have lived her life pretty much. <laughs> it, her whole life has been recorded. We spend years trying to find something on her. We cannot find nothing. But we're going to create something. So if we could not break her, we're going to see how much can we change people's mind or perception about her, which is what the big campaign, hate campaign, it's about. And this is your living. This is how you make money. And you're good on putting food on the table on a hate job. Make it make sense because I, I, I don't get it because I've you see now the more I listen to social media and see it's big business. It's almost like it's good to hate. And it clearly sells. It clearly sells. It obviously, right? And it's amazing. I don't like to get in talk about people's look. That's not my thing. But one of the thing is, I feel like sometimes they always say if your inside is ugly, it comes out outside. And so it's not like, you know, you could see the heat in those people's face. Yeah, I've heard, definitely heard that before. And I think there's, there's, there's probably some truth to it. It's just one of those things you think about. And you try to make it make sense and you really can't because you've got these the papers that can write about literally any bit of trivial nonsense about Megan. Even I think there was some story about some avocado, something. No it's right. like you can write about that but you're not gonna write in 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 a in a proper way about something that actually threatened the life of her kid. Yeah. Yeah, and, 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 I, and I think the problem that they are ha now having, they are running out of stories to tell. The, the hit campaign is just not working. It's not working. It's not going to work because people all get onto it like, well, when was the last time you say anything good about this woman? I mean, everything you want her to do, she's actually done. You wanted her to leave the country? She left. <laughs> you wanted her not to upset the money, to repay? She did that. And now she's living her life. Now, what is your problem? Well, I think it's just part of an overall agenda. I mean, I don't think these, any of these things are accidents. <laughs> I think that these, pay, these people who write these negative uh, articles about Megan, uh, especially they come from the, the larger publications, um, I think there's absolutely you know, a deliberate agenda about how to disenfranchise you know, who and what she's about. You know, and that doesn't count, you know, all obviously people who have, you know, uh, smaller outlets and they may have their own, you know, axe to grind uh, for whatever reason it may be. But I think when you start looking at um, the bigger publishers and certainly, you know, those who have the, the biggest audiences, I think that um, the fact, I mean, it's been proven right in the court of law. I mean, it's proven. It's a proven thing that they... Um, they set up erroneous and, and distributed erroneous articles about uh, both she and Harry. 
uh, for their own benefit because they know that it sells newspapers. Yeah, 36, 36, I think it's something like 36 allegedly sort of things as soon archetype come out. And the fact that, you know, I think one article that we were like, you know, oh my God, you know, why doesn't she shut up and all that, you know, um, nobody is listening. <laughs> and in the meantime, she, the show is number one pretty much like in a different market in some of the markets like she's like in the top 20 so obviously not when people are listening even you you are listening because you would not know that you you know what i mean so it's like make it make sense you know like uh, uh she will say make it make sense and so but i'm still scared for her i'm still scared for harry even though i i do feel like them finding their voice, them actually talking about what have happened. Obviously, there's so much that they can say. There's so much that, you know, I still they restrain themselves. I think um, they've been very, very good um, to just talk about some stuff, but not everything. Um, but I do. I, I do have uh, fear. I do have, I'm scared for them. But I also don't want them to be scared to do what they need to do, especially when it comes to protect themselves and protect their family. And so, yeah, because for me, I, I, seen, I seen her and me. I see us and her. And um, we. that's why we have to fight. That's why we have to continue. I think... Um, there's a huge community that comes about because of um, the mistreatment she received. And through that community, the first time, at least for me, to see a lot of them are black women, white women, and all sorts of people from different places and who actually sort of putting out voice out there and doing really amazing things, especially when it comes to charity work. Um, many of us probably always hear about doing charity work, never really involved. And then now all of a sudden that you know what, we are doing good things and that is changing. Like for an example, Center Bali, which is um, um, Harry started. Um, and that was uh, something for his mom, you know, and doing great job in Africa for young kids with HIV and teaching them that they can have like a long life and, you know, that's why he had the polo show. But, you know, the, the squads are very involved into that. And they raise money, raise a lot of money. And for Santa Bali, I mean, that is amazing thing that would not be possible, you know, um, just a couple of years ago. And now that everybody have a platform and we can sort of push the envelope forward and being able to have that conversation that would probably not maybe 10 years ago would not have been possible. So, yeah. So guys, I think it's a very long show, but we can't close out the show without talking about the, the sweetest story. Of course, for me, it's a little bit touchy um thing because um i just love my best friend um my baby oh god i don't want to cry oh god i'm not doing that okay 18 years um yeah many people myself it was, it was an old dog but he was very young he was he died young because he was jumping and doing a lot you know but the last two weeks of um before he passed everything went down and so it's been tough so to hear the story that um harry and megan went in adopt a you know an older dog and and the reason why is because they feel like with all the puppies it's going to be very easy but she may not be able to be um and so it was such a princess moment i think and so it was so sweet very sweet so guys um well we're back <laughs> we're back and um we are gonna continue with the show obviously there's 12 episode we didn't even talk too much about even the magazine <laughs> oh my god she looks stunning um but we are gonna continue we're going to be there each time she drop a show we're gonna talk about it we're going to 
go deep and then eventually we'll figure out um, what will be the plan for the show. Certainly it opens a lot of door and I think this conversation, we need to be a part of it. Um, and I'm happy to be back. So I hope you guys um, tune in. I hope you guys are listening. You subscribe, you sort of uh, um, pass it on the show and talk to everybody and um, yeah, so I wanted to thank you guys again. Thank you for being here with me, being a part of the squad. Um, I don't know if you guys call yourself squaddies, but I think they are. <laughs> so, um, yeah, thank you for being here. And uh, what a happy moment. It's our pleasure as always. Cheer, uh, cheers to Megan. Uh, Absolutely. Cheers to Harry. Let's not forget our boys or Ginger. <laughs> love you, baby. And I love you all. And I hope you guys are listening to this big long podcast. Good night.